The Founding Fathers didn't rap, did they? Not actually, no. They were pretty good at writing rhymes, uh, but uh, they didn't quite have rhymes and music at the same time. I, I get it. It was all a lie then. Yeah. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of things about our founding are lies. They yes. may be true of the <laughs> founding of Norway as well, but certainly of the United States. Thank you so much for coming. And my guest today is Woody Holton. And we today, as we might have hinted, we're going to talk about the Founding Fathers and the American Revolution. I'm excited. Let's get started. And as I always ask, how, how did you get into the American Revolution and this era of American history? Well, it's ironic that you asked about the Broadway musical Hamilton, because my first interest as a child of about 12 years old in the American Revolution also came from a play. And it was called 76. It was brutal. Uh, it was uh, not quite as cutting edge when it came out, I, I wanna say in 1969 or so, but it was, it was cutting edge in many ways. For instance, it was quite an anti-war show. Uh, it, it depicted a soldier who, who was dying by an apple tree and singing a song about that. And it, uh, it really commented on race in America, uh, pointing out that while the Southern colonies like South Carolina, where I live today, were deeply implicated in slavery, that, that play 1776 made the case that Northern colonies were as well, because one of their uh, biggest imports was molasses, which they then turned into rum. And we all know that you could, if you really wanna make a lot of money, sell something that people get addicted to. Oh. And of course that molasses came from the Caribbean where it was grown by slaves. So I was really struck by that play. It had fun uh, peppy songs, but also some very serious songs about war. This of course came out in the middle of the United States uh, invasion and occupation of Vietnam. Uh, and it had strong comments about slavery and race and, and especially about racism in the North, that it was not just a Southern problem, but it was an American problem or, or an American evil. So, so that play really got me, got me going on the, on the founding era. My father also, who uh, was a politician, he was very interested in Thomas Jefferson. And I became a big fan of Thomas Jefferson because he wrote, all men are created equal. Now, I'm less of a fan of Thomas Jefferson now than I was as a child. Uh, that was exactly 40 years ago. Oh, 50 years ago <laughs> that I was 12. I'm 62 now. I'm less of a fan of him now because I'm seeing more people than I saw uh, led by other historians, um, enslaved people in particular. Um, you know, he owned 600 people over the course of his lifetime. He also was a real part of not all the people are created equal anyhow. Um, right. Well, I, my the way I can hold on to some admiration for someone like Thomas Jefferson is that the principles that he laid down were magnificent, even if the reality that he lived uh, was not so great. Now, the way <laughs> I understood it, that he, when he put down the Constitution, that he wanted to put with African slaves as well, but he was scared that he would, he would piss off the South too much, so he let it, out, let it out that he was considering putting it down that, that African slaves was as well created equal, but he was afraid to piss off the South. Is there truth to this? Uh, I wouldn't go quite that far. Um, he, um, he never uh, said that Blacks were equal. He did denounce slavery, uh, which is to his credit, but um, he denounced slavery without ever freeing a single slave other than those he was related to. Both he and his father-in-law had sexual relationships with slaves that produced other slaves. And he did allow um, some, of the, some of his own children and his uh, sort of black nieces and nephews, et cetera, to escape. But, um, but this is the great contradiction of Jefferson and which does make him so fascinating to me is that um, he was an absolute racist. There are things that he wrote, and he only wrote, he only published one book in his entire life called Notes on the State of Virginia, published in 1787. And there are things he wrote in that book that are hideously 
racist, worse, as bad as anything Hitler said about Jews and, and gays and so forth is what uh, Jefferson said about black people. For instance, um, the old horrible myth that it led to so many lynchings in America that uh, black men were uh, obsessed with having sex, mm -hmm. uh, physically uh, you know, raping white women. It's not true. Of course, rape happens all over the world and it's terrible, but there's not a particular you know, black obsession with black male obsession with white men. And Jefferson spread that horrible, uh, very dangerous lie. Um, but again, he, he also had uh, four or five children by one of his slaves. Um, now, she was um, only one eighth African, uh, Sally Hemings, um, you know, having been the uh, having had lots of whites in her in her ancestry, but you just have to say that Jefferson is the same thing that you and I are, which was full of contradictions. So let's go back to the very beginning and start right before the revolution, because that's what's profound, what's that started the revolution in the first place. Because I want to begin with the British taxation. What what was the cause for the British the tax? America so much harder in this era? Um, the short answer is that the American Revolutionary War, in my opinion, would not have happened if it hadn't been for another war that ended in 1763. Um, and I don't know if you know that war, I would love to know what they mm -hmm. call it in, in Norway. In um, the United States, they call it the French and Indian War, because of course, the, the British colonists were in an alliance with the British government against the French and the people they called Indians, we now call indigenous people. In, uh, in Canada still today, they refer to it as the Seven Years War, or in French, Canada, la guerre de sept ans. But it didn't go for seven years, it went for nine years. George Washington started it in 1754, and then it finally ended with a Native American mm -hmm. Um, revolt in, that went until 1764. Anyway, this was this is widely accepted among historians as the first world war, the first war to have theaters um, in Africa and India and uh, at, all over at sea, all over the European continent um, and all over North America. So, so we think of it as the actual World War One, the first world war. Um, and the reason that it was so important was that it nearly doubled the debt of the British government. Now, it's not true to say that the British government was deep in debt, so it decided to tax the colonists to collect money from them to help pay off its debt. But what the British government wanted to do, to speak fiscally, was to stop bleeding. That is to stop spending so much money on America. And so officials in the British government assessed what were they spending money on in America. And they saw that one of the biggest things they were paying for was for the colonists to fight indigenous people, Native Americans, or they used to call them Indians. Um, and um, those uh, Indian wars were very expensive because you had to transport men and materials and some women actually who fought in, in those wars from the coast way up into the mountains where the Indians were. Uh, and so the British government really didn't want to fight any more wars against Native Americans. And so the British government did two things. Number one, it drew a line along the crest of the Appalachian Mountains. If you've ever visited the United States, you know that we have the coast, but then once you've gone about 200 miles in, there is a, uh, a mountain chain called the Appalachian Mountains um, that runs basically parallel to our Atlantic coast. And uh, the British government said to its own settlers, we don't want you to cross that line. You may not go beyond that line further into Native American territory. Now, this was not a humanitarian gesture on the part of the British government. They didn't actually care about the Indians as people, but they knew that every time colonists stole more land from the Indians that provoked the Indians to attack them. And then the British government had to come and suppress 
the Native American rebellion. So to stifle that process from the beginning, the British government said, okay, we are going to make our colonists stop taking land from Indians. And to enforce that, they actually um, left 10,000 soldiers in America at the end of that war in 1763. Uh, you could basically call them, to use language from the United Nations today, you could call them peacekeeping troops because these troops were going to hold the line, preventing Indians from attacking the colonists, but also preventing the colonists from attacking the Indians, provoking another war uh, with them. Um, and the British government, quite understandably, I think, said, okay, we are going to leave these 10,000 troops in America. Who should pay for them? Well, the colonists should pay for them. And so that was the first of the big famous tax laws, the Stamp Act, where the colonists in America, the free white colonists, had to purchase stamped paper for a lot of their legal transactions. And every advertisement that ran in the newspaper had to have a stamp on it that you paid the government for. Um, there was a stamp act and had been for decades back in Britain. It, it brought in a lot of money. And so they wanted to bring in money from the colonists to pay for those 10,000 troops whose job was to keep the Indians and the colonists apart. What's interesting about this to me is that had there been no indigenous people, then the British government would not have felt the need to leave this, these 10,000 soldiers in America after the war. And we would not have felt the need to adopt the Stamp Act. So no, the, Stamp no, Act the, way I, the way I understood things was that America was, uh, sorry, not America, but Britain, was also broke after the seven, pretty much broke after, after the Seven Years' yeah. War. Is that one of the reasons why they started the Stamp Act? Well. Yes, yes, but it's important for me to clarify that they didn't, the didn't the Parliament did not adopt the Stamp Act in order to collect money from the colonists and use it to pay back its debts. Hmm. That's not where the money went. They collected money from the colonists, or at least they tried to collect money from them, and they used it to pay for these 10,000 soldiers who were keeping indigenous people and the colonists apart from each other. And that may sound like a small point, uh, but where it's important to me is that we can, I would even go so far to say, had there been no Native Americans, there would have been no Stamp Act. And with no Stamp Act, maybe we don't even have an American Revolution. No, this taxation was obviously not very popular. So how did the, I wouldn't say Native, native but the, the settlers react to this Stamp Act? How, how, how long did it take before they said that? We, enough is enough. We don't, we don't want this anymore. Oh, it took an instant because, the, you know, I, I tried to make a case to you that the British government was acting very reasonably in leaving these 10,000 soldiers on the border between the indigenous people and the colonists and then asking the, the, their own colonists to pay for these, these troops. I think the position the British government, the parliament took was quite reasonable but I would also say the colonists were quite reasonable in saying no taxation without representation. They didn't say no taxation. And, you know, we have a, a political movement in the United States. It was sort of the beginning of, of Donald Trump was a, a group that called itself the Tea Party, who more than anything, they opposed taxes. But here's where they're different from the people who opposed the Stamp Act, because the people who opposed the Stamp Act said, no taxation without representation. They weren't against taxes in general. They were only against the idea of, of having to pay taxes to an institution, the British Parliament, in which they were not represented. Um, and, and the Stamp Act was a decent amount of money, but uh, the most ominous thing about the Stamp Act for the colonists was the fact that the, the people who wrote the Stamp Act were very open and candid and honest about the fact that the Stamp Act was only the beginning. That is, we will set a precedent with the Stamp Act. And after that, we will start to tax other things. And sure enough, they did try to tax other things. The most famous other thing they taxed was tea. Mm -hmm. And so that may be getting ahead of your story, but, but that's how we get the Boston Tea Party mm -hmm. in 1773, which really did 
that it was the Boston Tea Party. They, they, the colonists had, and the crown had been fighting back and forth over taxes and territory, like I've talked about, um, and trade, which we haven't really discussed. Um, they'd been fighting all, about all these things for a decade without it becoming a war. But once the colonists, I'm sorry, once the British Parliament taxed tea and the colonists in Boston threw the tea into their harbor and they did equal things in other big port cities like Philadelphia and New York City. That made Parliament so mad that it adopted a bunch of punitive laws. And those punitive laws were really what pushed the colonists into actual rebellion, that is into going to war. Because you had a 10 years of conflict uh, without it being a war. Now, it was violent. Do you know about tarring and feathering? I believe so, yes. Where, where um, you are a customs collector and you have just caught, I'm John Hancock, and you've just caught me um, smuggling molasses mm. into Boston. You know, I'm only supposed to buy molasses from British colonies down in the Caribbean, places like Jamaica and Barbados. But that was much more expensive molasses. And so I, John Hancock, and other uh, merchants in, in towns like Boston, we would buy our molasses from um, the, the island that's now called Haiti, uh, or Guadeloupe, or Cuba. These are French and Spanish uh, colonies. And France and Spain were the enemy for Great Britain in the Seven Years' War, and really for more than a century. And so this would be like me, Woody Holton, trading now with, uh, with ISIS or Al-Qaeda, um, you know, selling guns to them. That's it's treason if you are trading with the enemy um, or like a Ukrainian trade, you know, uh, um, selling selling weapons to the Russians, it's treason. And of course, the British were mad about that, but the colonists were mad. Not uh, were, were mad that the British were trying to stop them from smuggling. So again, I was saying you were a customs collector, an agent uh, on the wharfs of Boston, and you caught me smuggling molasses into Boston. You would seize my ship um, and sell it, uh, and the money would go to the British government. And so, of course, the colonists didn't like that. And so we would try to capture you as a government official and dip you in tar or, or put tar, which is they used it to um, to seal uh, the sails and, and, and to caulk up the, the cracks in sailing ships to make them waterproof. Uh, it, it comes from the pine tree, which I know you have plenty of in, in, in Norway. And so they would take this tar and put it on the person and then get a bunch of feathers, you know, that were destined for, supposed to go into somebody's pillow and put that on the person. And so it was a humiliation, but it was also painful because you can imagine yeah, if you that's... got dipped in tar, just, just finally cutting it all off of you would be incredibly painful. So there was violence between 1765 when parliament adopted the Stamp Act and 1773, the year of the Boston Tea Party, but it was sporadic violence. It wasn't a war. You didn't get a war until 1775. Now, of course, it talked about the Boston Tea Party, but wasn't there a Boston massacre as well? Was that after, before or after the Tea Party? Uh, it was before the Boston, the, the, um, the Boston Tea Party was on the night of December 16th, 1773. The Boston massacre was three years earlier, uh, March, 5th, 1770. But in the case of the Boston Massacre, the issue there was also trade, much more so than taxes, because um, what had happened was, after all of these poor government officials, British royal officials were tarred and feathered, and some were beaten up, uh, and, and some had their houses and their own boats uh, destroyed by these, this mob in Boston. After all that happened, the British government said, we've got to protect our government officials. But, you know, a very reasonable thing for the British government to say. And so the British government sent troops to occupy the town of Boston. There were almost as many soldiers in Boston as there were um, male civilians of that, of that age. And whenever you have troops occupying a city, 
it's it's like a, a keg of gunpowder. You're just waiting for the spark that blows it all up. And that came on March 5th, 1770, when uh, there was a single guy collect, uh, guarding the customs house, that is where all the government's money was kept. And some boys came and started hassling him and throwing snowballs at him. You know, it starts innocent enough, but then it quickly escalated to where he, that one soldier called in other soldiers to protect him. And um, the, apparently there was no order to fire, but so maybe somebody slipped and accidentally fired. The problem with that is you'd think, okay, one person gets killed, that's sad. But in those days, and I think it's still somewhat true in many militaries today, that when one person fires, that's a signal shot. And it signals everyone else that they should fire as well. And that's what happened on March 5th, 1770. And that's the Boston Massacre. Five Americans were killed. So what, what happens, you went, went, let's go back to the, the Boston Tea Party. What happens after? Is, is it immediately war or is it, does it wait on, hold on a little bit before they let the things escalate further? Um, it's not immediate, but you can really see um, a chain of influence. You, 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 know, you know what I'm talking about, a chain, you know, this, this link leads to that link and that link leads to that link and so forth. Mm -hmm. So first we get the British Parliament adopting the tax on tea. They did that way back in 1767, but in 1773, they tried to really enforce it. So they passed a new law to enforce it in 1773. And then December 16th, 1773, we have the, the Boston Tea Party. And it was, it was three shiploads of, of tea went into the harbor. That's a huge amount of private property because the East India Company, of course, was a private company that's, that's being uh, stolen. If you look at it from the perspective of the owners of the tea, they were furious and parliament was furious. And so parliament adopted a bunch of laws to punish Boston and the whole colony of Massachusetts. Um, uh, the most important ones were closing the port of Boston so no ships could come in or go out. They, um, uh, Massachusetts had this very cool policy called town meetings and they still have it in Massachusetts and several neighboring states today where most of the decisions of how to run Boston were made by all of the adult males. Now, of course, it's men and women. Um, but they took away, basically took away the town meetings from Boston and the other towns said they couldn't meet, they couldn't uh, make th those decisions. And they passed, Parliament passed a law called the Murdering Bill, which said that if something like the Boston Massacre happens again, uh, then the soldiers who kill um, American colonists will be sent back to London to be tried. And you can see why the colonists called that the murdering bill, because they were certain that every jury in London would find those soldiers innocent and they would have like James Bond 007, a license to kill, a license to kill Americans. And so all of those things infuriated Massachusetts people and other colonies, even though none of those laws targeted any colony except Massachusetts, the other 12 colonies, there were actually 26 colonies in, in British colonies in America at the time. I mentioned our Jamaica, Barbados, there was Nova Scotia, Quebec, which of course is, they're still with us now. They're still part of the British Commonwealth now. But anyway, um, 12 of the colonies adjacent to Massachusetts stood with Massachusetts. And I would say that's a combination of um, they were showing solidarity for their fellow Americans who were suffering. The phrase they used was they're suffering in the common cause. So it's a combination of that. And also um, it happens to be that that happened, as I said, in, at the end of 1773. At that time, the whole British Empire was in the middle of a terrible recession um, and uh, much worse than the one that we went through about 10 years ago. And so um, people were looking for economic solutions. And it turned out that what the colonists decided to do to protest parliament adopting all those laws was a boycott where they would buy nothing from Britain and sell nothing to Britain. And for complicated reasons that we don't need to go into unless you want to, uh, 
that boycott also helped Americans economically. It gave them an excuse to, um, to not buy as much stuff as they'd been buying before. And that helped them get out of the recession. And I told you the colonists agreed not to send anything to Britain either, not to export to Britain. They delayed that for one year. And it turned out to be a very clever move because if I'm producing, um, if you're, our Vol our Volvos are from Sweden, aren't they? But if Sweden wanted to say to the rest of the world, okay, we're gonna stop exporting Volvos to the rest of the world, but we're gonna start next year with that boycott, then everyone would rush to Sweden to buy Volvos while they still could. And the price of Volvos would go way up. And that's what happened with tobacco and other commodities that the colonists produced and sent to Britain. They said, we're gonna stop sending you tobacco next year. The, the intervening year, they sold their tobacco at an extraordinarily high price and it really helped them get out of the recession. So I think that boycott, they called it the Continental Association of 1774. It's an example of how people do things for multiple reasons. The principled reason that the other 12 colonies were standing strong with Boston and Massachusetts, and the more practical reason as well of, of um, trying to drive up the price of tobacco. So where does our, our founding fathers, or not ours, but yours, founding fathers come into the picture, like Thomas Jefferson, Hamilton, and George Washington, et cetera, et cetera. Where, where do they come in, into the picture? Um, well, this is one of the great questions of the American Revolution or our Civil War or, or any country's history is how much did the individuals matter? Um, if Thomas Jefferson hadn't written the Declaration of Independence, couldn't John Adams have written the Declaration of Independence? Um, the, and I, and I, I would say that's mostly true. Um, the two that I see as the two individuals who were individually important are Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. Uh, Franklin less than Washington, but Franklin really was an excellent diplomat. And it's hard to imagine the American colonists winning the war against Britain. Uh, you know, Britain had the most powerful navy in the entire Atlantic Ocean, not more powerful than China's, but China wasn't part of the story. It was, it was in the Atlantic Ocean and they had this amazingly powerful navy. Well, but who had the number two navy in the Atlantic Ocean? That was France and, and with them, Spain. And so I think the biggest question, once the war, once the shooting did start in April of 1775, the big question was, um, will the colonists fight Britain alone, in which case they're likely to lose, or will they fight the, um, the British with allies? And as you probably know, they did acquire allies. They, uh, they got the French formally in 1778, the Spanish informally in 1779. And um, it's really hard to imagine the colonists winning without, without France and Spain. Now, the question is, suppose John Adams had come to uh, France to negotiate a treaty with, with, with France. And in fact, he was sent over in 1778, but uh, while he was in the water, uh, Franklin went ahead and made the, made the arrangement with France. So the question is, would somebody like John Adams have also signed the deal? On the one hand, I think, yes, probably, because France didn't join into the war because uh, Benjamin Franklin was a charming person. He was a charming person, but that's not why they got into the war. France got into the war because France hated Britain. Uh, and likewise with Spain, you know, the big battle between Catholics and Protestant uh, nations. And so only if you'd sent a really bad diplomat, and actually John Adams was a really bad diplomat. He was the sort of person who would tell you just what he thinks of you. Um, and um, and he, uh, 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 he was the very opposite of a diplomat. So it's possible if the Americans had only sent John Adams, um, then uh, he would have just pissed the French and the Spanish off and we wouldn't have had a treaty. But, um, but actually, I think 
while Franklin did a good job and we give him credit for that, um, I think Jefferson, he was also charming um, and he, he would have uh, been sufficient lubricant to lubricate this deal between um, Britain uh, and France. So, so Franklin was important. The one I do think is more important than Franklin is Washington. And uh, here, here too, I kind of have to qualify that statement because Washington uh, became commander in chief of the Continental Army. He arrived there ironically on, um, and, and took over on July uh, 3rd, uh, 1775. So a year and a day before the Declaration of Independence. And it's an important reminder that this war went on for a year, more than a year, before the colonists actually declared independence. But Washington showed up in, in Cambridge, where Harvard University is today uh, and was then, showed up in July of 1775 to take over the army. And A, he was famous. He had been active in that previous war that we call the French and Indian War. And he was extremely wealthy, mostly because he married the wealthiest widow in Virginia, Martha Dandridge Custis. Uh, and so he was sort of a celebrity. And most importantly, he was a Southern celebrity. And by having a Southerner as the head of the army, that persuaded Americans that this, this was not just Massachusetts battling Britain, but all 13 of those colonies. Now, I say there's comp complexity here because Washington, in my opinion, start off as the wrong general for this war because he was a very aggressive, assertive guy. Um, you know, you've heard maybe the myth that he was able to throw a coin all the way across the Potomac River. That's not true, but he, he did. Uh, there are, there's a more verified story about how he was able to bend an iron bar and things like that. He was a, he was a, he was a tough guy. He would be uh, um, playing um, sort of a real life ball. David Crockett, then. He, uh, sort of like Dave, Davy Crockett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So anyway, he was a tough guy, but with that physical toughness came a mental toughness that says, "I never want to be on defense. I always want to attack." Oh. And what other Americans tried to persuade Washington of was. That's not the strategy that will win this war. The British have more soldiers. They're better trained. They have a, a much better supply of ammunition and, and um, gunpowder and all of that. The only way we can win this war, Washington's generals kept telling him, was to build up um, walls and dig trenches and make the British come to us because in the 18th century, and this is true, you know, you know about the, the trench warfare of World War I or the, uh, the First World War uh, in, in uh, 1914 to 1918. Um, and, and it's still somewhat true now as the Russians are discovering in Ukraine that um, defense has a natural advantage. Now, sometimes offense can do something tricky like Washington sne sneaked across the Delaware River on Christmas night, 1776 to attack the town of Trenton, New Jersey and captured a whole uh, German army. The Germans uh, had rented their soldiers to the British. And you've heard of that, probably Washington crossing the Delaware. So I'm not saying that the defensive side always wins, but the defensive side usually won. And um, if Washington had just arrived to take over that army two months earlier, he would have seen that because, or one month earlier, because on June 17th, 1775, the, there was the Battle of Bunker Hill. And officially the British won that because it was a hill near Boston where the Americans had set up um, a redoubt and, um, and palisades and trench and all that stuff. And on June 17, 1775, the British captured Bunker Hill. And so by the 18th century definition, if you end up with the hill at the end of the day, you won. But in achieving that victory, the British suffered 50% casualties, which was just unheard of at that time. And so... How, how quickly um, could the British resupply with soldiers from in, in that time, the post in, from, from the UK or 
from underwear generally? How quickly it was not they an infinite. Supply? No, that's a great point. It was not an infinite supply. Um, it was hard to, to, to convince people to become soldiers and they essentially drafted people and that led to draft resistance. Um, so yeah, that was, that was part of the problem. Um, but the, the, even the bigger issue is that while um, Britain then as now was not exactly a democracy, the British public did have some influence on parliament. And you know, when you received a letter saying your son had been killed in America, that would certainly have the effect of making you less supportive of Britain's war uh, in America. Another uh, thing and, I, and not yeah. to mention the expense. Go ahead. Another thing I want to ask about is how, how did the French and Spain, Spain support the Americans? It wasn't really just money, it's all troops or weapons supply. How how did that how did the French and Spanish Spanish support help the, well, the Americans win the war? For the first two years of the war, in fact, even before the Americans officially declared independence on July 2nd, 1776. Uh, for the first two years. Of Whoa, the spoiler war, alert. Yeah, right. um, yeah, we celebrate the press release, not the actual action. But uh, the first two years, the, the, the French provided aid somewhat similar to what the United States is supplying to Ukraine and, you, and NATO are supplying to Ukraine. Um, they supplied weapons, but they didn't send soldiers. Um, and uh, or, or warships. And, and in fact, they did it much more covert, covertly. You know, NATO is pretty open about, about the fact that they're sending weapons into Ukraine. So, th so it was, um, you know, one of the worst things the United States has done over the years is called covert aid, you know, when they send weapons to the a group called the Contras in Nicaragua, uh, or, uh, or you might say the United States did a good thing when, when the Soviets controlled Afghanistan, we sent covert weapons to the Taliban, which of course ended up being our enemy. Anyway, covert, covert uh, uh, shipments of weapons is what the French did for the first two years. But then when they um, signed a peace, uh, a, an alliance with Benjamin Franklin in February of 1778, after that they started sending um, armies and navies to help with the war. And that was really crucial because the British, um, as I said, had such a powerful navy. And Spain actually didn't ever sign a treaty with the United States, but it did indirectly. Spain allied with France, which allied with the United States. So Spain helped us as well um, and, and gave money and weapons. Um, and while Spain didn't send soldiers to fight the British. Well, yes, they did. They, they you know, Spain controlled Louisiana, uh, including sort of the capital of Louisiana, New Orleans. And they, in 1780- Wasn't that French territory at the time? Uh, it would become French territory after the uh, war, but no, in 17, between 1763 um, and the outbreak of the war, and, so, and then its conclusion in 1783, no, that was Spanish territory, um, and um, and operating from um, New Orleans, Sp a Spanish army, a very diverse Spanish army, by the way, made up of Native Americans, African Americans, French speakers. As you you're right, the French had been there for a long time until 1763, uh, and so so a lot of them were French speakers, but they they attacked what's now the states of Alabama and Florida and captured them. From the British, but again, the, the uh, maybe it's just a technicality that the Spanish did not sign a treaty with the rebel colonists in America, but they were both fighting the British, so they really didn't need to sign a treaty because they were my enemy's enemy is my friend. Um, so anyway, but I want to go back to George Washington yeah. as a general, uh, just very briefly, because he was determined to be uh, to go on the offense and capture hills from the British. And his general said, don't do that. Um, don't do that, make them attack us. And it's interesting, you know, the British captured New York City in the fall of 1776. And from that moment, Washington spent the rest of the war obsessing with trying to recapture New York from the British. 
And as you well know, it's an island and it was the British who controlled the water. So it would have been very hard to even get the guys over there. But then once they got there, they would be marching up cliffs into cannon fire. And it would have been a very, very difficult thing. And so here's my, I think, amazing statistic that I got researching my book. And by the way, I'm going to plug my book. It's called Liberty is Sweet. Um, I don't have the copy with the cover, but there it is. Oh. The, um, um, the Washington, here's an amazing statistic. Washington devised more than 12 different plans to capture New York from the British um, in great detail. We got everything all set up and ready to go, but then he never carried out any of those attacks because he was slowly learning the lesson from the people under him that the way for the Americans to, uh, to win the war was not to go on offense, but to make the British come to them and, 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 and assault the Americans while the Americans were the ones hiding in trenches and hiding behind a dirt uh, mount, mounds, palisades, they called them, uh, and so forth. There's a great line in John Milton's poem, um, uh, Paradise Lost, those also serve who only stand and wait. And really the Americans discovered First, everybody except George Washington, and finally George Washington discovered that the way to win this war was to stand and wait. And while there was well, what a dramatic... makes them realize that the, the, the offense might be like the, sorry, defense might be the best offense. What makes them What's realize? It? Well, what makes them realize that defense might be the best offense? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. That's that's the best way to put it. Yeah. Well, now, how does it's it? It's not like they were this? never attacked. I mean, they they did they did uh, lay siege to. Yorktown, and that's what finally put them over the edge. But that only worked because they had French, the French Navy helping them and all these French cannon and stuff. They couldn't have done that until the French were in the, in the war. So at least until they got the French helping them, the Americans were wise to, to follow that rule. The best defense is a good offense. Uh, best let's, offense let's, let's talk about the Battle of Yorktown. How significant was this, the Battle of Yorktown for the revolution? Well, let me say on this one, on the one hand, on the other hand, because on the one hand, it was not the final battle of the Revolutionary War by any means. Um, people were still fighting uh, well into 1782, and there were even a few uh, deaths in 1783. And remember, part of the war is going on in the West, Native Americans allied with the British uh, against the, the colonists, and that war went on for more decades. And so so it would be a myth to say that Yorktown was the last battle of the Revolutionary War. Oh, actually, we talk about Hamilton again. As you remember, John Lawrence is killed near the end of the play, Hamilton. Um, and that was in August of 1782 in my state, South Carolina, which was also his state, in a completely unnecessary battle that he was just doing it to get the glory. But that was long after Yorktown. So Yorktown wasn't the final battle. On the other hand, Yorktown was a significant enough loss for the British that as soon as Parliament found out about their loss at Yorktown, they uh, sent orders to their generals in America, stop all offensive operations. And they also sent diplomats in the other direction, that is over to France, to start negotiating with France and with the, the American colonists, people like Benjamin Franklin over there in France, so to, somebody to, actually I haven't mentioned yet, and I, I, I almost forgot mentioning as well, is Hamilton, because he's, as you know, the main character in the musical Hamilton, and he is on the $10 bill for a reason. So how, what was his part in, and, and for obviously we know if you listen to Unseen or Seen Hamilton, but how, what was his role in the Revolutionary War? Oh, I hate to disappoint, but his role in the Revolutionary War was not large. Uh, he, I mean, in fairness, he was a young man. He had just uh, been uh, just out of, of college at what was then called King's College, now Columbia yeah. University. Uh, and he served as an aide uh, to Washington. He served as an artillery captain before that. Um, and he did get to play an important symbolic role at Yorktown. Uh, there was very little sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat at Yorktown. There was mostly just both sides firing cannon at each other, but there were uh, 
a couple of redoubts. That is does that, does cool. they steal cannons from the British at one point? Uh, steal cannon from the British. Oh, that would be, you might be referring to um, um, oh, Ticonderoga, where ah. the Americans captured a fort uh, up in what's now upstate New York. Um, and that was really crucial because that did give them the beginnings of, a, of an artillery uh, um, battalion for the for the U.S. Army, but no. Now we're talking about the end of the war, Yorktown. Um, the there were there were two redoubts again, small forts, number nine and number ten, and um, it was clear the Americans were going to force the British to surrender at Yorktown. But these two forts had to be captured first, and so um, everyone was falling all over themselves to use the American expression, uh, begging George Washington to let them lead the assault. And Hamilton, uh, Washington, he, Washington very wisely determined that not based on who he liked, um, but based on, on seniority, determined that Hamilton got to lead the American assault. So he did get to have this heroic moment, but I don't think anybody would disagree with this. That is the people who studied Hamilton, the person rather than Hamilton, the musical, everyone who studied his role in the Revolutionary War would say that the outcome of the war would have been exactly the same if Hamilton had never lived or if he'd fought on the British side or whatever. Now, where Hamilton does become really crucial is in um, developing the American economic system, which he which really- Which we will, of course, talk about after the revolution. Yeah, yeah, hard. yeah. Yes, in 1790, he or 1789, he developed this plan and then there was a manufacturing plan that didn't work out so well, but the financial plan, and just to say that in one sentence, was there was a huge debt left over from the war, and the debt had been bought up by speculators uh, who were going to make ridiculous, ridiculous profit if they were paid back. But Hamilton insisted we have to pay these speculators back in order to establish the credit rating, that is the financial credibility of the United States. And, and so that was an absolutely crucial thing. The funny thing about it is that he's seen as a financial genius. And he was, he was I don't want to take too much away from him. He was pretty bright. But really what he did was just copy the British system. And so, it worked well for them, so why not? So we don't have to talk about the next step, which is of course they win the war, and then what happens? Does the British leave immediately or do they stay a little longer and let things slowly develop? Uh, it, it was a slow process. Um, and actually this will give, uh, uh, give me a chance to mention a group that we really haven't talked about uh, very much, uh, which is African-Americans. Um, the British had issued an emancipation proclamation, very similar to the one that Lincoln would issue 87 years later. Uh, because, and they didn't do that. They weren't freeing slaves because they thought slavery was terrible. A few British people thought that, but the British government didn't. The whole British empire was built on slavery, but the British government uh, needed soldiers. And so uh, in November, 1775, they issued this offer to black Americans. If you will fight on our side, then, uh, and if you survive the war, then we will free you after the war. And something like 10,000 uh, African-Americans did join the British uh, over the course of the war. Um, and in fact, one of the grievances that finally pushed the colonists, the white colonists into rebellion, remember they were at war starting in April, 1775, but they didn't declare independence until July, 1776. What pushed them over the edge? Well, they were mad about a lot of things, but one of the things they were mad about was this alliance that the British government had made with their slaves. They believed the purpose of the British government in America was to protect them from their slaves as well as from indigenous people, Native Americans uh, and so forth. Anyway, something like 10,000 African-Americans fought on the British side. I should mention that about 10,000 fought on the American side uh, as well, um, the, mostly in the North where there weren't that many uh, African-Americans, many, many enslaved people. But in the North, basically in the North, um, if you were Black, you, your best chance of getting free was fighting for the American side. But in the South, 
the Americans didn't make that offer where all the slaves actually lived, 90% of them lived in the South. And so the only way to get free if you were black was to fight on the British side. Um, something like 10,000 did that, only about 5,000 survived the war. It was an incredibly punishing war, disease mostly killing people, but bullets as well. Uh, and and many, cap many slaves were recaptured and, and executed. Um, but the story of those 5,000 or so African-Americans who fought for the British, survived the war uh, is fascinating because um, the British did keep their promise and free them. And of course they couldn't leave them behind in America. So many moved to London. It was the beginning of the significant black population of London, which still, as you know, has a large African component. The largest number moved to Nova Scotia, uh, which was one of the 13 British colonies that did not rebel. Um, and there they were oppressed by other uh, colonists, other British colonists, white British colonists. And so many of them accepted an offer to resettle in Sierra Leone and form the basis of, of what's now the country of Sierra Leone in West Africa. Uh, and so theirs is an amazing saga, but, but I mentioned them in the context of your, your question, you know, was Yorktown the end? No, um, it, it, Yorktown was uh, October 19th. 1781. Well, in the summer of 1783, the British were still in New York. They had uh, signed a treaty saying that they, um, a preliminary treaty saying they would leave New York, but they were still there. And they had, of those 5,000 Blacks who fought for them, 3,000 were with them there in New York. And George Washington goes to the British general named Carleton and says, you got to give us back our slaves. Um, and sure enough, the, the 1782, 1783 peace treaty did say that slaves had to be returned. But General Carlton said, no, we may, our diplomats may have promised you that, but we made another promise before that. And that was our promise to the slaves to free them if they survived, if they fought on our side and survived the war. And so um, you had this flotilla uh, fleet of ships leaving New York Harbor. Um, in the summer of 1783, sailing mostly for Nova Scotia with all of these black people who had been enslaved most of their lives, who had fought in the war for the last, for the previous seven years and who were now headed to freedom. And, you know, as an American, we've become very patriotic as we think about immigrants sailing into New York Harbor past the Statue of Liberty and coming to America for freedom. But in 1783, you had 3,000 Americans sailing out of New York Harbor past the future site of the Statue of Liberty and headed to freedom in the British Empire. Some of you we mentioned talked about earlier, you, you said your first patients, oh, you started studying the American Revolutionary War was Thomas Jefferson, which we haven't really talked much about after and during the revolution, but how did, but he was in France, wasn't he, at, at the time, so how, when does he return to America and what makes him come back to America after the revolution? Um, he, um, he went over in 1784. So the war was over, but he was chosen to replace Benjamin Franklin as the American ambassador to France. Um, and um, you had this wonderful partnership for about four years with um, Jefferson in Paris as our representative there and John Adams in Britain as our representative there. I kind of belittled John Adams' diplomatic skills earlier in our conversation, but one place where he really did do a good job was in Britain. And that's because ironically, he admired the British so much, even though we'd just been at war with them for seven years. So anyway, the two of them were over there together as, um, as diplomats. And so both of them missed the convention in 1787 that wrote the United States Constitution. Um, and, and so it's a great, and people from other countries, a lot of people in America forget that the Americans did not just declare independence and write the Constitution. Uh, they declared independence in 1776 and they started writing their own state constitutions but 
it's not a mistake that they were called states because you know Norway is a state, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, those are states in, in, in the English language. And so people would go, well, you know, shouldn't we refer to the United States as the United Provinces or the United Departments or something? But no, that's the point of the US is that for those fir that first decade from 1776 to 1787, Virginia, South Carolina, where I live now, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York, those were states. In, in Spanish, we'd say estado, or in French, etat. They were nations to use modern language. They were as much, they were as independent of each other as Norway is from, from uh, Sweden or, or Finland or France today. They were in an alliance, but you know it was equivalent to the European alliance or NATO and the, and the European Union and all that stuff, but they were, they were separate. And then it's amazing to think that having broken away from the British empire in 1776 and established these 13 little miniature, miniature nations they decided, some of them decided in 1787 to merge those 13 states back together. Uh, they had broken out of the British Empire and now they were starting an empire of their own. Now, that's not to say the states disappeared. The states still have important roles even today. So, you know, we're having a big debate about abortion in the United States today. Oh, yeah. And, you know, um, South Carolina, very conservative state, a red state, we say, is probably going to abolish abortion, even for victims of rape and incest, which is, in my opinion, very sad. But New York uh, won't abolish it at all, will we'll permit it. And so there are, the states still have some power, but for some of the most crucial things that governments do, like go to war, or pay for war, or determine the money supply, a lot of these responsibilities in 1787 were handed over to this new national government. And that's another whole story for another day. And I think we both probably need to leave soon, but I will tell you the number one reason the Constitutional Convention handed all that power to a national government was that it did not trust the voters. And they, it, they, the, the authors of the constitution thought we'll put all these powers in the hands of a national government as a way of putting it like um, with my someone gives my child a bunch of candy i'm going to put it on the highest shelf i'll give them a little bit that night but then i'm going to put the high the rest of it on the high shelf where my kids can't reach it you've got a high shelf behind you there too uh, uh, the high shelf allow prevents the kid from getting to it and in a sense the u.s constitution does the same thing to american farmers it puts some of the most important powers on the top shelf where they can't reach it. That is in a national government that was very hard for them to influence. And it's still hard uh, to influence. Something, something I want to ask you is what, what makes George Washington want to become serve just temporarily as, a, as we control it today, President? What, why did he choose to become king, for example, himself or dictator as we would call it today? Well, what made him want to choose a, democracy um not stay in stay indefinitely on it until that's strong it's thrown for, for well that, it was admirable i'm not sure that was actually an option i think if washington said okay i'm going to be like julius caesar and i'm i've won the empire's battles and now i'm going to come home and set myself up as a dictator mm. then people wouldn't have loved him so much um and i think they would not have tolerated that um he, he could have, he, he certainly could have, you know, he stepped down after only two terms as president. We now, only since the 1940s, we now limit our president to two terms in office, but that, that restriction didn't come until the 1940s. So Washington could have kept on going and been president for a third term or a fourth term. So I think really the noble thing he did was that. Uh, as it turned out, um, he died in what would have been his third term. Had he stayed on for a third term, he would not have finished that term because he died in December 1799, three years into that term, uh, into what would have been his third term. Instead, it was Adams's term. Um, and so had Washington accepted re-election, people would have voted for him. Had he accepted re-election, he probably would have established a precedent that once someone is elected president, unless they do something really horrible, 
then they remain president until they die. You know, that's the case for our Supreme Court justices now. It's uh, that's a lifetime appointment and uh, unless they do something terrible. And um, and so, yes, I think Washington does get credit uh, for that. Um, but I don't think the I don't think Washington being a king was ever an option because he was very popular. He wanted to stay popular. And had he said, OK, I'm now going to be your king, then his popularity would have vanished uh, overnight with most people. Um, and, and can I say and one yeah, you, did, and you did the Caesar analogy analogy and you see see what happened to Caesar. He was popular in country in the Gallic world during the Gallic Arab tribes and then he made himself dictator and you see what happened. So yeah, I can see why he chose to yes, that's true. not to become a dictator. So yeah. Had Washington, what, that's true. Had Washington become a Caesar, then someone else would have become Brutus for, mm -hmm. for sure. So yeah, uh, I think we rounded up pretty well there. The American Revolution. Before we go, where can people buy your book? And do you have anything links you wish me to put in the description? And thank you so much for coming in the podcast. You, whatever you wish to promote, now is Harry. Now is a chance. Oh, oh, I, I, I don't have a copy of my book with the cover. It's somewhere. So I'll just hold this up again. It's called "Liberty is Sweet," uh, a phrase that. Um, might sound like it's something that that Patrick Henry or George Washington said, but it was actually a reference to Washington's slaves who took advantage of the of the chaos of war to escape. And the man in charge of watching them while Washington was gone said, "Well, you, we can't really blame them for leaving because liberty is sweet." So uh, everybody was was fighting for their liberty, but sometimes one person's battle for liberty conflicts with somebody else yes and uh, of course i gotta ask before you go what what did you think about the musical hamilton oh i thought it was wonderful as a musical but i was so disappointed that lynn manuel miranda chose a very traditional book um by an author named ron chernow uh chernow is a very good writer but uh, he tells the same story. I've read, I've read many biographies of Hamilton, and they all tell basically the same story. Mm -hmm. And there's so many exciting books out there um, that, to me, would have been much more exciting for that project. Oh, here, I am going to put my phone down for one second, because I'll give you an example. There's a book called A Midwife's Tale. Hang on, I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. uh, see it behind me there. While I'm at it. Just uh, four, four, five, a few uh, seconds. He's looking for his book right now. Yeah, there you go. If, if, uh, if fate had been different, then this would have been the full book that Lin Manuel Miranda found. You know, he was headed down to his home in Puerto Rico to, uh, uh, and he needed a book to read on the beach. And I just wish he'd found a book like this, the Midwife's Tale, which is about a midwife in what's now the state of Maine between 1785 and 1812. She delivered nearly a thousand babies and did not lose a single mother um, in, in, during that delivery stage and very few of the children. In fact, the you know, men were at, just at that time starting to take over the job of midwifery from women. But uh, Ballard, uh, uh, Ulrich, the author of this book, produced the statistics to show that the men um, did not have nearly as good a survival rate for either mothers or babies as this midwife did. And, you know, it's not surprising that midwives are kind of coming back uh, in many parts of the world because, uh, anyway, so, so I, it was just broke my heart that Lin-Manuel Miranda wrote all those amazing rhymes uh, just to tell this very traditional story that's what we call great man history about Washington and Adams and and especially Hamilton. And by the way, I found a copy of my own book. Yeah. There it is. Um, there's a little bit of a secret here. Do you see this fellow right here? That's actually a woman, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the more interesting stories in the book. Now, anyway. you, don't, you don't give credit, though, that he might have set a lot of young people in, in uh, becoming interested in the revolutionary era and want to look more into it, I think. That's... Absolutely. Absolutely. And who am I to complain? Because mm -hmm. as I said at the very beginning,
uh, I became interested as a 12 year old uh, in the American Revolution because of a Broadway musical too. So absolutely, if, if that, if, if, if the play Hamilton becomes an entry point and people go on to read uh, books about Native Americans and, and midwives and, and African-Americans escaping uh, and get away from the traditional story, um, which is important in itself, but it's not the whole story, then sure, no, I'll have to agree with you. That's a good, that's a good thing. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been Modat H12. We are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you can find podcasts. Please consider to like, share, and subscribe. And also, if you've got the time, please rate, give us a rating on Apple Podcast and write a little review. That would mean a lot to us. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Alan, and I'll see you next time.